In 2011, I was writing for a website called HowToGeek.com. It's still around, still a great website. They do awesome stuff. I wrote for them for about two years. And as part of writing, I wanted to create a video series for them. I wanted to explain how foundational technologies worked in an unconventional way. And this was 2011, so things were different then. Solid state drives were pretty new to the markets, and spinning disks were what everyone used. So I wanted to explain some of the differences and talk about uh, some of the things that happened at the time that just people didn't understand about. I hope you enjoy the video and don't be too rough in the comments because, again, this was 12 years ago. All your information is stored somewhere, whether that's in your brain, written down, or in your computer. That information needs to be stored somewhere so that you can forget about it and recall it later when you want to read a book or watch a movie. But how exactly is that information stored? I'm Justin Garrison from HowToGeek, and I'm not a neuropsychologist, so I can't tell you how your brain works, but what I can do is help you understand how your computer stores information. The computer can be such a mystery. People use it every day for getting things done, but they have no idea how it works. To a lot of people, it's kind of like their cars. For your car, you have to put gas in it, you change the oil occasionally, and every once in a while you have to pay the mechanic an absorbent amount of money to change your flux capacitor. But where does the gas go in your computer? How do you change the oil? And what happens when you change the flux capacitor? I can't explain all that in one episode, but what I can do is start with the hard drive. Back in the early days, computers used to use physical media to store information. Well, this isn't quite the punch card that they used to use, but those are really hard to come by these days. On the punch card used to be a series of holes that would show the computer specific instructions that it needed to know how to run a program or store information. But one punch card was never enough. So at that point, they just kept adding more and more punch cards until they could run a full program or recall a document. You'd have to feed the punch cards one at a time into the computer to give it the special set of instructions to run the program or recall the document. But if you happen to mix one of them up or put it out of order, you basically end up with a blue screen. But what else uses physical media to store information? You might be familiar with this, the record. It only ever stores music, but it does do the exact same thing where it has a vinyl medium that has bumps and grooves that stores the song you're trying to listen to. So whenever you want to listen to that song, you essentially put this in a computer that recalls the song back to you. The computers that would read these were a lot more simple than the computers that would read those. But what about magnetic storage? When did that come into play? Some of you might recognize these. You see, like the record, they also stored music, but instead of vinyl, they used this magnetic ribbon here to store the music. But these weren't digital, and so that's going to have to wait for another show. These, on the other hand, were digital. You see, inside the floppy disk was a iron-coated plastic disk that would store all the information that you were writing and reading from it. When you were writing bits, it would actually change the bits on the disk, and when you were reading, they'd stay put. Let's have a closer look. You see, the information is stored on the disk in a row called a track. This track goes around the entire ring of the drive, and each eight bits represents one byte of information. As the reader passes over the bits, it determines if the bits are on or off. In binary, this is on and this is off. If you want to write information to the disk, the reader will pass over the bits and apply a magnetic field. Thanks to ferromagnetism, these bits will stay indefinitely charged until we change them. Here we've written the letter A. No, 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 this is an uppercase A. This is a lowercase A. But what does all this have to do with your hard drive? Hard drives don't use these plastic floppy disks. Hard drives actually use hard disks. Whoever named these things wasn't very creative. You see, the great thing about hard disks is they can store more capacity, but the bad thing is they're really susceptible to fingerprints and dust and sorts of things. That That's why hard disks are stored in these airtight cases. But this still doesn't explain things like MBRs, journals, and file systems. For that, we're going to turn to another storage device that's a little bit easier to understand. The filing cabinet has a lot of similarities with your hard drive. They both store important information, they both share a lot of the same key components, and they're both magnetic. The first thing you need when writing information to a hard drive is a controller. Oh. The controller is responsible for reading and writing information to the hard drive. They get all the information from the hard drive, and share it with the rest of the computer. But when you're writing information to the hard drive, 
You can't just open it up and start throwing stuff in. You see, if you do that, you won't have any organization and you won't be able to recall the information later. The file system that you need is responsible for all the features that you're going to have on the hard drive. Let's say you lost power while you're writing information to the disk. You see, on old file systems, that information will be lost. On newer file systems, like NTFS and HFS+, they use what's called a journal to write information to the hard drive. You see, the journal is responsible for staging that information and making sure that the information gets written properly. Once you scan it into the journal, then you can write it to the disk. It does take a little bit longer to write files to the hard drive, but you can also use that time to store that information in a buffer. The buffer allows you to first stage things into the journal and then put it in the buffer to free up time for the controller. Let's take a closer look at that file system. The file system is responsible for organizing all your information on the hard drive. The file system uses those clusters we talked about earlier to store the files on the drive. Let's say you wanted to write this movie to your hard drive. Well, first, you need to update the journal. Then you move it over to the buffer. And once the controller is ready, you actually write it to the hard drive. The last step in the process is updating the index. The index tells you where all the files are stored on your hard drive. How do some of the other parts of your hard drive work? We've already established that the filing cabinet drawer is kind of like a hard drive platter, and the filing system is kind of like your file system. But what about partitions? Where does that come into play? But what about partitions? Partitions are arbitrary separations on your hard drive. They allow you to store other operating systems or other file systems on the hard drive. But where does the hard drive know to look for that partition information? For that, it uses the master boot record. The master boot record is stored at the very front of your hard drive. It doesn't have a file system, and you can't store information there. But it's used to reference all sorts of information on your hard drive. You see, when your computer first boots, it looks at the very front of your hard drive at byte 0 and begins executing the next 440 bytes of code. That's not very much information to run a program, so usually that just points to somewhere else on the hard drive that it can run. That first 440 bytes of code is known as your bootloader. Next is six bytes of optional information. Next in the master boot record is the partition table. Intel devised a way to reference four different partitions with 16 blocks of code. Each block of code is a pointer to a partition on your hard drive. That gives us 64 full bytes of information. After that is two more bytes for the master boot record signing, giving us a total of 512 bytes for your master boot record. Now that you know how all your information is stored, let's look at the different components of the disk. You see, the disk is first broken up into sectors. Each sector is basically just a slice of the disk pie. These sectors intersect with a track. A track is one bit wide and goes all the way around your disk. Where both of these intersect is known as a block. This block is the smallest piece of information on your hard drive. It's only 512 bytes of information though, so it's not very usable. In order to make this more usable, we combine multiple blocks into a cluster. These clusters can be one block or ten blocks. We can arbitrarily set this amount so that we can store more information per cluster. The cluster is the smallest piece of information that your file system can see. The only problem is you can only store one file per cluster. You need to make sure you pick the right cluster sizes for your purposes. If you have really small files, you may not use all the cluster space. But if you have really large files, you're going to have to span multiple clusters, and you're going to have a higher degree of fragmentation. So hopefully that explains how your hard drive works. But there's still one other type of hard drive we need to address. You see, with a traditional hard drive, there's a lot of moving parts and things that can break. Even just to read or write information, your hard drive needs to spin up. You can read or write all your information, and then the drive spins down 
when it's not being used. That right there takes time and also wears on the parts. And that's why the solid state disk was invented. Solid state drives take a different approach to storing information. Instead of storing all the information on platters hidden from the controller, everything's out in the open so the controller can see it all at once. The drives still use master boot records, file systems, and journals, but they don't have the slowdown from the hard drive spin up or spin down. If a controller wants to write information to the solid state drive, all it needs to do is find an available cluster and write the information to disk. All this speed comes at a price. You see, there's still one flaw that we need to address. Solid state drives use NAND flash, and NAND flash has a limited amount of write and erase cycles that it can do. That means that the more that you put information on and take information off the drive, it's going to wear out faster. But which do you think is going to wear out first? This? Or this? Solid state drive manufacturers still warranty their drives for five years, which is the same you're going to get out of a traditional hard drive. The only point of failure on a solid state drive, though, is the amount of times that you write and erase information from it. And unless you're writing more than five gigs of information every day, you're probably pretty safe in that five year mark. Because a solid state drive has a limited number of write and erase cycles, you never want to defrag a solid state drive. On a traditional hard drive, if you defrag it, you'll put all the files in order so the controller can see them and read them in that order. On a solid state drive, because all the files are in front of the controller at the same time, you won't gain any performance by moving them around because it doesn't matter if one part of the file is over here and the other part's over here. Defragging a solid state drive will only kill it faster. I hope you have a better understanding on how your hard drive works and that you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to head over to howtogeek.com for any other how-tos or leave comments on the website. I'm Justin from HowToGeek and always remember to back up. Thanks for watching and big shout out to Lowell who is the head of How To Geek for letting me record the video and never actually editing it at the time. Uh, he gave me budget to make the props and time just to say, yeah, we can try this. And I feel a little bad, it's 12, 12 years late, but here you go. And big shout out to Ray and Nate and Seth, all of my friends who showed up on a Saturday to help me film this. They brought the camera gear and the audio equipment and improved the shots greatly from what I had written in the script. If you learned something new about hard drives, please leave a comment and let me know what. I'd love to hear from you. And I'm still working on videos kind of like this. So if you want to hear about something else explained in a similar way, let me know.